stage, you're, you're kind of just sort of haphazardly looking all over the place, wondering, you know, what do I need to pay attention to? Is, I'm traveling by things so fast, you know, I need to pay attention to it all. <laughs> and there it goes. Zap. And, and so uh, a beginning driver tends to dart around, you know, kind of you know, with no system uh, to, to their searching and scanning. Uh, as you progress, you start getting this like sweeping system going. Okay, you're, you're searching the, the sides of the street back and forth, kind of methodically, in order to notice anything differently in your path, the, including the, the signage on either side of the streets and other, other parked vehicles and vehicles trying to enter the road. Okay, and then as you get going, see if it, uh, yeah, let's see. it you're staring right down the street. What, where's your guys' environment? Let's see where you're at. See if we can see. Yeah, here we go. You're staring way off into the horizon. You're getting past the, oh, you're on a, are you on an ice program? Yeah. Black ice? Yeah, yeah. Good one. You've gotten pretty far. You, you stare off way into the horizon, like this. And you allow your, oh, you're speeding. Too fast. On the ice. Busted in front of everybody. <laughs> All right. And, and that's what, you, you're allowing your peripheral to kind of work for you, to the sides. Did they tell you, did you hear in a little bit early on how much of your vision really is just central? Did you guys hear? Even less. Three, you got it. Three degrees. Three degrees of the whole 180 happens to be, we'll come back and look at them later, uh, happens to be uh, your central vision. That, that's the equivalent of this. If you had a quarter, all right, Put it, put it in between your, your index finger and thumb, and you extend it arm's length from you. You see out there, and that's it. That's only three degrees, the width of that, that you see in focus at all times. So you see how important you know, rule number two is. If that's all you ever see in focus, you've got you to gotta keep your quarter moving as you're driving. Keep, your quarter, keep looking in those side mirrors, the, the rear view mirrors way up ahead to this side. What are you looking for? What are you scanning for? Tomorrow I'm going to ask you the question, what are you looking for when no one's out there driving around you? No one's with you in the car. You're on your own. You're soloing. What are you looking for when no one's around? What kind of things are you hunting down with your eyes? What are you looking for? Animals, okay. Animals are hazards that could dart out in front of you. No? Here, we'll just use that symbol to indicate hazards on the road. Yeah, possibly. Absolutely. That's one of the four major What else? What else is it for? It's always out there. Okay, there's other hazards. And yeah, down on the surface of the road, if it's really dark out, you won't be seeing that sort of thing. We had a lot of bad rains lately. If you drive through standing water, you're going to go the regular speed through it? What might you be worried about under the water? Hydroplaning, what else? Things there that you can't see beneath the surface, and maybe part of it, the whole, exactly. You don't know. The level of the water is, is steady and even, but underneath you don't know what the surface is at the floor. Okay, and it could have been swept away or you got those big potholes. You won't know it. You go through it, you could blow out your tire, blow out your suspension, whatever. So you're looking for those hazards. Even more. It's always out there. Always out there when when no one's around. It's, it's on the road. Speed it's on the road. What's that? Speed bumps. Good. We call those controls. Speed bumps are traffic control devices. Signs are traffic control devices. What else? Traffic control devices. What do you have? Stop lights. Think of a hole. And even without any lights and, and signs, you got stuff on the road that tell you what to do, right? What's that? Oh, oh, lines. Oh. There it was excellent. Good, good. Where to stop, where not to stop, the color of the lines, everything like that. That's always out there. We're really going to look at that tomorrow. But those are the things that you start allowing your peripheral vision to look for as well as you're driving. Okay? Those are the three major rules. Everybody got them down. Aim high, keep your eyes moving, get the big picture. That's Harold for you, okay? We still teach them today. And we teach these other two. It's how we teach driving in this country, generally speaking. We don't teach drivers like um, in, in Germany to go really fast and, and enjoy the, the 
you know, the, the mastery of their BMW on the Autobahn. On the Autobahn. Traveling at what speeds? You guys know? 150, 180 miles an hour, potentially, in their fast lanes. Around the cities, it, they're allowed to go upwards of 90 miles an hour, too. We have only one state in this country that has allowed that. You guys know? It just, but yeah, last year. Texas. Texas, Montana used to have a kind of an unlimited speed uh, zone, and they called it dry, dry prudent, two conditions and things like that, but everybody took advantage of it. And we're speeding through their state, so they shut that down. Now it's 75 there, but 90 in Texas. People don't know how to drive at those speeds, let alone uh, on the Ottawa. Sorry, man? Um, there's some people 80. 80? Yeah, you mean you mean country rural highways or freeways, expressways? Like they're, yeah. Like they're not allowed yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The fastest we can go in this state is what? Seventy. Sixty is the normal, but after you get out of the uh, metropolitan area, it jumps up to seventy. And that's it. Okay, well, it's supposed to be it. Now we don't teach that kind of aggressive driving. Okay, that's pretty offensive. And they actually require their, their drivers to go through so much training that they get good at that, actually. They, they require, for instance, in, uh, in Japan, that there's students there at age 18, before they get their license, can uh, need to get about 20, 20 hours of instruction from a licensed professional before they drive and get their license. Here we only do, what, five, six hours? In Germany, it's 30 hours. Think of the cost. It's three thousand to five thousand dollars for drivers' traffic safety in, in, in Germany just to get their licenses. Well, they respect the automobile more. You know, they know what it's capable of doing. They want the they want the uh, the driver everywhere when they're using their road surfaces to be aware and handle it better than just your average person learning five hours a week or five hours in driver's ed or something like that. So. They invest a lot more in it. We don't do that. We gotta watch out for bad drivers because that's all we train typically in this country, bad drivers. You have to do what? Not drive offensively, but drive defensively. That's the word. Defensive driving. That's, again, sort of the basis of the last two rules that Harold came up with. Okay? Think, start thinking like a defensive driver. How do, you, how do you protect yourself on the road? What do you do? What kinds of things? As you're out there driving, you're out there messing with the general public. What do you watch out for? What do you, what do, you do? Yeah. Attract the other cars. Attract the other cars? Yeah. How? What are some things on your vehicle that let other cars, other motorists know that you're there? Lights. Lights. Excellent. They didn't have all those lights. Like what? If we're taking the left. The law requires what? Turn the signal on. How far in advance? That's a rule. Anybody know? 100 feet. 100 feet, actually. That's good. So, in this state, we have a law that extends the rule of Herald that says, be seen. Be noticed. Also, what other senses? Be Heard. How are we heard by others? Use your horn. Yeah, be ready for things. Uh, somebody's backing out of a stall you know, in, a, in a parking lot at a grocery store, and you're trying to get past them. You just <laughs> you just watching them, or you watching them back into, or are you going to do something about it? You're going to do what? You're going to lay on your horn. You need to. You've got to be ready for that. Most students don't ever do that, by the way. You're afraid of the horn, and shy, or something, but. And bite back. You know, you know, be ready with it, okay, to protect yourself, your car, your occupants, all right? If you're traveling down a freeway and you're in the carpool lane, you're tending to go what? A little faster than the other vehicles in the fast lanes, the other lanes of the freeway. It's heavy traffic. Well, what are you worried about with some of those cars right beside you? Doing, pulling right, cutting right, right in front of you. Be ready. Be ready to let them know that you're there. What's another way to let them know that you're there? Even during the light of day, put on your right. could could put on your headlights, your flashers, your 
your, your brake lights, tap them and let people know that you're slowing instead of just easing off the gas pedal because that doesn't alert them very well, right? Your brake lights don't go on. These are all, all the equipment on board your car are ways of extending, applying this. Okay. Um, so, be seen, be heard. What's, a, what's another thing you can do? This is, this is one that's real important because you, you want to avoid crashes at all costs, right? That's what, you want to get there safe. Get there without conflicting with other people on the road. Uh, what do you do? Ah, uh, you might have other you know, potential conflict. It gets kind of congested. And now people are coming into your space. What are you worried about? Side traffic, right? Following distances. What are you worried about? People tailgating you? Well, what should you do? Things like that. Here's an extension of Harold's rule. Harold's rule, number five, always have an escape route for times, you know, plan for, for things like that, scenarios where you have so much traffic, people coming up fast behind you. You get boxed in, you know, on the freeway by, by two semi-tractor trailers. No good. Get out of there. Okay, you've, you've blocked some of your escape route potential. So open it up. These days we actually talk about something a little different. We've gotten a little more sophisticated. We talk about what's called zone control around your vehicle. Open versus closed zones. Okay? Imagine your car, your vehicle, whatever it is you're driving, right in the middle of this kind of zone here. You're right here. This is you. And every vehicle in progress, forward motion, has these zones forward and behind. Around that you kind of want to leave open. It's, it's your space cushion, you know, so you feel a little bit better about others around you. Okay, when, when people start to enter your, your space, you start feeling what? You know? Right? You feel a little awkward. You feel a little cramped and cramped. No, you feel that way, especially with your, your vehicle. Protect your vehicle. Get too close to me. So, you've got these front zones you always need to be aware of. One, two, three. Directly in front of you, of course. Directly behind you. Rear zones. Four, five, six. The left and, and the right sides, the lateral sides. If we wanted to keep, just theoretically, 50% of the space cushion around your car, that would equal how many zones? Of course, three. No, which three would be the most important to keep open at all times. Which one? The front three? Okay, here's a suggestion. Let's go one, two. Okay, so let's, let's lay down our some automobiles here. Can you grab one or two of those behind you there? Here's a vehicle, here's a vehicle. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, so you got all these three open up front. That's good. But now you're, you're driving, you're the leader of the pack here. That's what you are. You're, but what are you worried about? The back. If you have to stop, don't leave, you have to you know, swerve, avoid something. Okay, here they come. You're not we're very well protected to the rear. So those are pretty close, but we need to open up some more space. So which ones? The back three. The back three. Okay, now let's just put you in the in the back of the pack. Okay. Now everybody's in front of you. Are you worried about anything? I'm stopping. Stopping. Yeah. Well, and look at the the driver. Do a little profile of who this might be and how how they might drive. Right. Who are they looking for? This is a highly distracted driver, not because they're eating the ice cream. They're looking for their customer on the side of the road. Okay, so they're going to stop suddenly for the kid darting out waving the cash. Are you ready for that? It doesn't matter if you see it happen. You're following too close. Your vehicle won't be able to stop in time. Crash. Okay, so let's go back. Let's put space of three vehicles. Four vehicles, five, let's go with this, and we nope, we've got that, this guy, we've got one more, let's go, here we go, got them, got them everywhere. Alright, you're the blue car, get out of that mess. 
What? You don't like those student drivers. Yeah, I know. That's what they think about you guys. So, whenever we drive around, nobody likes to be behind a student drive car. So you want to get rid of that one? Okay. That's zone number two. Okay, so we open up two. You like five also. Okay, let's get five out of there. We got directly in front of us, directly behind us. We have what we call our following distance and our preceding distance from vehicles behind us. All right, that gives you a better accurate space cushion because you're in motion still. And the greater the speeds, the more what? The more distance you want to have in between those other vehicles. What's a good adequate uh, following distance? What would you say? Three seconds, okay. We've been teaching that for a few years now. Um, it's actually just about four years ago. These Germans again, if they're, they're out of bond. They, uh, they discovered that if you add another second to that, you have a one second advantage, that's the terminology, of getting out of a crash 80% of the time to something happening in front of you. Because our actual average reaction time as humans is only three seconds. So we want to add a second to that. All right, three seconds is really adequate for slow speeds, but we're talking the Autobahn speeds or freeway speeds around here. How do you judge something like that? How do you make sure that you're back far enough? You guys know a couple of methods or how to do it? Here's the vehicle way up here. How do you know you're, you're at a safe following distance from the? You got I got a hand up. Look at the, the little like, markings, like, you know, like a sign. Okay, sign. Sign right there. You time it. <laughs> time what? The, the, okay. the distance it takes to get to there. Excellent. After this car passes it. So here they are. They're even at their passing. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. Shouldn't get to that object, that sign, whatever it is that you use as your marker. Very good. Until those four seconds are up. Okay? That's adequate freeway speeds following distance. Around your, around your, you know, city traffic or in your neighborhoods, look for the three second following rule, okay? And it's on your test. It's an item on your skills test, following distance, we're watching for it. That's a good one. Okay, same thing with preceding distance. How would you judge that? You want all this, you don't like, is this, this is you. You like that feeling of being followed so closely? Oh, what are you gonna do? Slam on your brakes. No. no. What are you going to do? Tap the brakes a little bit. Tap the brakes just a little bit. That might incite some anger in the person behind you, but yeah, that might help you know, get them aware. Maybe they're just looking down at their phone or their stereo or something. So that might, you know, flash a little light. That might help. Okay. If that doesn't work, what are the other options? Do you know what? Drift. Drift? Where are you going to go? <laughs> You drift accidentally like, and you go too much. Ah, you don't want to do that. But you can't go to a side. In other words, you want another open zone, don't you? Start looking. We've got two and five. What's another open zone? We're hoping to. You like one? Three. You definitely want three. I hear one. I hear three. Okay. We're, you all agree it's up front, right? Because why? Well, it's the direction you're going. Okay, if you were going backwards at higher rates of speed, then you want something to the rear, of course. But now we're going that way. That way, we want one or three. Which is going to, now think like a driver in this country, okay? Which one do you want open? The driver in this country. You want what? Any, any Japanese drivers here? Anybody from India? In England? Three. How come? Because there are more exits, that's true. There's off more to the right. space off the, to the road. There's but more space off this direction? So if you're in the three, there's more space off on the off road. Okay. How is that created? What are you what are you concerned about here to to the left? What, the other side of the road. Most roads in this country are what? There's only two kinds of roads. Two kinds of roads. What do we have? Only two kinds. Think of freeway versus. Yeah. What? What? Which? Uh, and, and traffic does what? 
We've got opposing traffic, and then we have what? One-way traffic. I'll go in the same. So those are our freeways, our expressways, and things like one-way streets. Opposing traffic. Which which do we have more often? Opposing. That's right. There's a lot more streets doing that. So it's hard to control this traffic that's coming at you in front of you, opposite you. Hard to control that space. They want to use it, and they're they're gonna use it. You can't. Don't get in there. Okay. So we want to the right. If they happen to shift over like this, they drift, it, they drift into your lane now. And they're going head on with you. Where do you want to go? Three. It's just you two, huh? Three. To, to three? Yeah. It's just you two. You guys are on the rug. You're playing chicken, right? Oh boy. Going head on. Why is it a bad idea to go into one? There potentially could be other oncoming traffic. You gotta watch out for it. People coming in. They don't expect you to go over there. Okay, true. But it's just you two now. Just you two. They would do what? What kind of driver are they? A driver like you. Born and raised, trained where? They train themselves to do what with their wheel when they see something head on. Where? That. You see somebody head on, you go like that. You have to be quick like that in the event somebody does go ahead or swerves into your, your lane in front of you. It'll happen. Right? So now you've got to get in the head. If, I have had a lot of Japanese students too over the years. Um, they come and they want to get their license here because otherwise they'd have to wait till 18 in their country. And guess what they have to do when they go back? Yeah, yeah they got to learn to do this and back the other direction because they drive on the on the left side of the road there. Like, uh, seven, well, 25 percent of the world's population does that. Most of us do this. Most of us do this. We're right-handed drivers. And now you got to start training yourself to do that. Keep to the right. Keep to the right. Keep to the right. Major rule in this country. How do you keep to the right? Well, what do you look for on the road telling you where to go? What's the sign on the, directly on the road that tells you keep to the right? To, to, keep to the right of what? What do you look for on the road? Which one? Yellow. Color. Bingo. That's it. It's the yellow line marker. That's the one that tells you. Basic rule in traffic safety. Keep to the right of that. When you get on a freeway, guess what? You look down at your freeway entrance. Okay, and you're heading up the ramp, and you can see lines. Here's one of your, let's just say that's the freeway entrance ramp. And you, and you look down and you see this solid yellow line. Quick, what's it telling you if you're going this way? You're on the wrong side. Very quick. Good job. Yeah, you're going the wrong way. Drift back in. Turn around, go the other way, go the right way. Even on the freeway system, we put down this as a safety marker. All right, you want to be on the right side, not the left side of that solid yellow line. That is the divider line. Very good. Okay? So you chose wisely. We've got zones. All right? Five, three, and one. Here's all of the space you want open around your vehicle. And you have a 50 50 chance, hopefully, of getting out of the way of something in an escape route to avoid collision. You got to do it at faster speed sometimes, right? It requires a lot of agility, a lot of awareness. This is why using your eyes is so important. Some people say that 90% uh, of driving is using your eyes. You know, just think of the 10 second path that you're traveling. And you take your eyes off the road for just one you know, and tenth of, of that time. One second, all right, 10%. Well, a lot can happen at 60 miles an hour if you're glancing over your shoulder just one second. You traveled maybe a quarter of a, you know, a third of a football field. And, you know, maybe 100 feet, you know, something else could happen. So that's why you always got to be using your eyes. Use your eyes, I say, and your head together in tandem. Use your eyes and head together in tandem. This is where we uh, move in traffic safety into another
development. <laughs> Got some crashing going on right there. Yeah. They just had that lesson in class. All right. Let's go 30 years into the future from the 1920s. What do we got? 30 years later. 1950s. Oh, wow. Big, big years in, in traffic safety. Drivers and instructors came up with something new to teach the public because, well, things were changing rapidly in our driving world. In the 50s, what happened then? What was going on? What do we call that era? It's just after World C, we have World War I, good, and we have World War II in the 40s. And then in the 50s, we start doing what? All those GIs, people come back from war, from both ends. And they start doing what when they get back into the start of the muscle cars? Start what? Of the muscle cars. It, it was. It's right on the verge of that. You've got the hot rods, uh, and it's a, a teen culture developing on the road. If you guys ever seen uh, American Graffiti and, and Lucas's early film, George Lucas's early film is awesome. Harrison Ford is in that too. And it kind of features that. Well, the 50s brought all these GIs back, and they start making what? They start, they start making babies. You ever heard that? The baby boomers. That's, that's where they're from. We're making all these people, yeah. All these people are being born. They got to be carted from one place to the other by how? Cars. What happens to our roads after you start rebuilding the infrastructure? You've got more vehicles, more automobiles, different kinds, different sizes, faster ones, muscle cars on the road. What happens to our roads? Yeah. We have to make them bigger because now they're really congested. What's the easiest way to make a road bigger? Widen it. Widen it. Get it wide. And do what then in between? Control lanes. Control lanes. Good job. You have, you have the advent of something in the 50s you never saw before, and we call it the, you probably know it by its symbol, interstate. interstate. That's right. There was no such thing before the 50s. The interstate happened in the 50s. So now you got these big wider roads. And you have people like my grandfather from uh, South North Dakota, who was only driven on country roads and dirt roads and two-way traffic and two lanes. Well, you get him out there on that, he doesn't know what to do. It's a little confusing. Okay, now you've got to start teaching differently. How do you teach people? Well, teach people to stay in between these lines they never had before, travel alongside each other, keep out of each other's lanes, look a special way for them, all right? People weren't doing head checks back in those 1920s. Now we have to start pe teaching people how to look over their shoulder into what area? Your blind spot. Your blind spot occurs just past your periphery, where you can't see beyond the side of the car. Your, your, your mirrors only look like this direction. So you can't see this car out here. You have to do what to make sure that no one's there? You've got to deliberately look over your shoulder. You've got to teach people differently. In driver's ed, teachers came up with this so-called process to teach people to be more observant, be more aware. This has a pronunciation. This is it. What is it? How would you pronounce that? It, I mean, it's IPDE. They pronounce it the IPD process. IPD process. Empty process. In the 50s, driver's ed teachers came up with the empty process to keep you guys a little more in tune to what's happening on the roads. You're still using your eyes, still watching, basic concept that Harold came up with. Watching, using your eyes, evaluating, using your head. I said earlier, you can't just use your eyes and in, in your, in your brain, you have to use what? You're driving now. You got to use hands and feet. You got to act. These concepts are drawn out a little bit further, expanded, in terms of what your evaluative process is doing. Identifying is the first one. You're using your head to look for things. All right? You're picking out, like you guys said, those those signs on the road, beside the road. Anticipating, you know, what you might have to do. 
figuring it out along the way. P stands for actually predicting what might happen or what you might have to do based on what's going on in front of you so quickly. Okay, I see a whole stream of cars suddenly turning their brake lights off. You're predicting what? If you, if there's kind of a quick stop maybe up ahead because of congestion on the freeway or something in the road. You don't know, but you're predicting and you're, you got to decide to do something. That's next. It could be a whole bunch of objects. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Decide and decide to do what? You got to not keep it in your head, but you got to do something with your limbs. Right? And they just said execute an action. Execute whatever that may be. It may be just simply you know, lifting your foot up off the gas. That's slowing your vehicle to react to the cars in front of you. Or, or maybe you lift your foot up off the gas. And then also go to the brake pedal, too. Or maybe you just tap your brakes to alert people behind. Or maybe somebody said it earlier, put on your, your hazard lights. Something like that to let other people know, hey, there's a problem up there. Okay? The empty process is uh, what we teach today across the country. Uh, to, to handle this complexity of our roads and our driving population. Only today we talk about it as being the SAFE method. It's a similar acronym actually, S-A-F-E, S-A-F-E, okay? This one stands similarly, you'll get a video on this right now, but uh, it has to do with scanning, okay? Assessing the road, so using your head, finding solutions just like deciding, course of action, and then E, yeah, same thing, execute, okay? Here's the safe method.